Chapter 10, entitled, Wounds Are Not Painful. Paris papers are giving front page coverage to the French man who wins the Nobel Prize in Literature. Marie, having won her second Nobel Prize in Science, is scarcely acknowledged. The tabloids are espousing worries of being invaded with foreigners at the Sorbonne, and the accusations continue that the foreign female students are enrolled in husband hunting. Marie, returning to the classroom of the Sorbonne to teach, will only last a couple weeks. By the end of December, she is in debilitating pain. Using an assumed name, she is taken to a hospital and treated for fever and kidney infection. The press catches wind of Marie's stay, and the rumor mill purports that she went to the hospital to have Langevin's baby. Wanting to squash the continued revilement, Marie agrees to have her medical condition made public. The strain is taking a toll on Marie. She needs a kidney operation. The doctors believe Marie is too weak to survive the surgery. She is sent home to rest, but there is no rest. Marie's home in Sco is no longer private. It is a public spectacle, and Marie decides to sell and move to an apartment in Paris. Marie has the operation in February. She is so ill she can't stand by herself, and her weight has dropped from 123 pounds to 103. She gives instructions to de Bierne and Goyer for what to do with the radium that is in her possession should she die. De Bierne is handling all of her personal affairs. Marie will later tell her daughter Eve that during this time she was on the brink of suicide and madness. The concerted effort to publicly humiliate and crush her just might be working. In spite of her ill health, Marie agrees to see a delegation from Poland. They want Marie to leave Paris and come home to Warsaw and be the director of the Radiant Institute being built. They tell Marie, quote, Our people admire you, but they would like to see your work here in your native city. This is the ardent desire of the whole country. If we have you in Warsaw, we will feel stronger. We will lift up our heads, which have been bowed down by the weight of so many misfortunes. May our prayer be answered. Do not push away the hands that are reaching out toward you. End quote. The Polish delegation is led by Henry Sienkiewicz. He was also a recipient of a Nobel Prize. Marie, because of her daughters, though, will not leave France. She promises to direct the Institute, but still live in France. She sends two of her best assistants, both Polish, to provide the day-to-day -day guidance. Demands don't stop because Marie is ill. Settling the debate about the unit of measure is requiring her attention. Decisions are overdue to have a means of controlling the quality, purity, and procedure for how radium is being used. International mines and facilities are providing materials that register varying levels of strength. With no checks and balances in place, the degree of strength being advertised is not the same as what it is in the substance being sold. Having a standard would allow doctors to prescribe a consistent dosage. And Marie has stipulated, quote, For measurements dealing with new questions, only my laboratory is in a position to solve the problems which arise. The meeting to discuss establishing the standard is in Paris, the spring of 1912. Marie is too ill to attend, so de Bierne goes in her place. Decisions are made for a definitive process and a standard is agreed upon. The measurement, a curie, is the amount of radon exp expended by one gram of radium per one second. This is used for medicine, industry, and research. Marie agrees that her original measured sample of radium will be moved to the Bureau of Weights and Standards in Severs. 
In return, she insists on being paid or given a replacement for both samples, the sample she is sending and the replacement. Marie's tough side also applies to running the lab. Still not having the new laboratory promised years ago, Marie keeps a sharp eye on the work of her staff and running the current lab. She learns that one of her assistants is planning on operating a separate laboratory. Although this assistant had worked for years with Pierre, Marie writes to him, quote, Having considered your current situation and the needs of the laboratory, I feel that it is no longer possible for you to do the things I need done, and I ask you to resign from your post as an assistant immediately. End quote. That summer, Bronya urges Marie to rent a place in the country to get away and rest. O only close friends know Marie's whereabouts, and she uses an assumed name to avoid any publicity. Eve and Irene are either visiting their mother or they are with Jacques and his family. Marie continues her convalescing with a visit to Hertha Ayrton in England. Hertha is a leader in the National Suffrage League. Her recent work is to promote a law which will allow a wife to keep her salary rather than having to give it to her husband. Hertha attends demonstrations and is one of the women arrested in the first march by the English suffragettes. Sentenced to nine months in prison, Hertha goes on a hunger strike. Due to an international petition, she is released. As an aside about her, unlike Hertha, Marie is never an outspoken proponent for women's rights. Marie supports women through education, positions at the laboratory, and references for jobs. Hertha later asks Marie to sign a petition that demands the release of three imprisoned British suffragettes. Marie agrees and explains this exception to her normal stance and says, I accept your using my name for the petition because I have great confidence in your judgment and I am convinced that your sympathy must be justified. End quote. And back to the text. Hertha has nursed back to health many of her fellow suffragettes who were released from prison after their hunger strike. Previously, women were tied down and force fed. Luckily, the authorities have stopped this tactic. Bringing them back to, from the brink of despair and death, Hertha helps them heal, but she doesn't coddle, and Hertha will help Marie. Area locales and the press do not realize that Hertha's guest is the famous Madame Curie. Marie takes this time to gather her strength and to recover from the shock of having her private life smeared across the tabloids. A turn in the tide comes with good news about the court hearings for the Langevin case. Marie's name is kept out, and she hopes this will give sway to the Sorbonne that she can continue to teach and work in the laboratory. While Marie is away, the separation from her daughters is difficult. Plans are for Irene and Eve to come and visit their mother in England. Marie arranges a piano teacher for Eve and a math tutor for Irene. For the times the girls are not with their mothers, with their mother, the three of them have a stream of letters traversing back and forth. The girls describe hiking and cycling trips and express their worries about their mother's health or the health of their goldfish. If they are at the shore, the girls write descriptions of the waves. Irene is starting to feel more independent and is referring to her mother as my dearest rather than my sweet May. Being the older sister, Irene gives account for her younger sister, and Irene writes, Eve and I are well, and I have been swimming as much as possible. I only missed once since you left. These days the sea is rough, but I still swim, and it's fun. And I, Irene will also have questions about her math, and she writes, I couldn't answer problem number two, the two equations with two unknowns, but I'm sending you numbers three and four. Mr. Hornoy helped me with number three, but I did number four all by myself. In October 1912, Marie is back in the laboratory in Paris. Here, Marie can find sanctuary to concentrate, to measure, and make notes, all with no interruptions. 
and Marie must once again defend her work. Sir William Ramsey, who was a Nobel chemist, uh, Nobel Prize in Chemistry 1904, has published his work on the atomic weight of radium. He published an experiment where he states his results prove Marie's work is false. Marie writes to Rutherford her astonishment after reading Ramsey's article, and she says, he conducts he concludes that his work is the first good work on the subject. I must say that I was astounded. Moreover, he makes some malicious and incorrect comments about my experiments on atomic weights. End quote. Keep in mind that Ramsey is the same person that said to the media, quote, All eminent women scientists have achieved their best work when collaborating with male colleagues. End quote. Ramsey is peeved because he wanted to control the radium standard and he lost out. Marie, a woman, has control of the radium standard and she will prove Ramsey his assertions wrong. Spring 1913 and Marie is back to teaching at the Sorbonne. Since their promise to Pierre, the Sorbonne still hasn't come through with the money for a new laboratory. When the Pasteur Institute offers Marie a position, Marie threatens to accept and quit the Sorbonne. More impetus comes when Austria also offers to create a state-of-the-art laboratory for Marie. These offers move the Sorbonne to make the money and land available to begin building. The laboratory will be known as the Radium Institute, with an additional building for medical research. Marie is intimately involved with the planning and building. Workers become accustomed to Marie climbing up the scaffolding to ask questions. She will fulfill Pierre's vision to have a first-class laboratory. The budget covers a salary for the gardener because her plans include a garden with lime trees and rambler roses. One spring afternoon, Petite, the Curie's assistant from the old days at the shack, comes to talk to Marie. He tells her there are workers who will be tearing down the shack and he is wondering if she might like to come and see their old place one last time. Marie goes. In the seven years since the Curies vacated the run-down building, it has not been used and nothing has changed. The blackboard still bears chalk notes written by Pierre. Marie writes, quote, I made my last pilgrimage there, alas, alone. On the blackboard, there was still the writing of him who had been the soul of the place. The humble refuge for his research was all impregnated with his memory. The cruel reality seemed some bad dream. I almost expected to see the tall figure appear and to hear the sound of the familiar voice. End quote. It will always be difficult for Marie to even say his name. Albert Einstein is in town to speak for the French Society of Physics. Einstein's wife, Mel Meleva, is with him. The Curie and Einstein families enjoy time together so well that they decide to share their summer vacation in the Swiss Alps. As an aside, Albert's friendship with Marie includes the practical as well as theoretical discussions. Albert needs a reference letter for his new position at the Zurich Polytechnique. Marie offers to write the letter, and Einstein accepts. Back to the text. Two weeks of hikes in the Alps with include Einstein's eldest son, Hans, Albert, and Marie's two daughters. On one occasion, the three youngsters burst out laughing when they hear Albert say to Marie, You see, madam... What I need to know is exactly what happens to the passengers in an elevator when it falls through the air, end quote. Albert hasn't figured this out yet, but he will. In November 1913, Marie is coming home to her country, Poland. In Warsaw, Marie attends the dedication of the Radium Institute built in her honor. This is a far cry from attending the underground flying university so many years ago. One ceremony is at the Museum of Industry and Agriculture, where she had first found her love of chemistry experiments. Another moment of poignant nostalgia follows. Marie sees a familiar face in the audience. 
It's Jadwiga Sierkowska, the elementary school director who had risked her life to teach Polish children about Poland. Marie goes to her and kisses her. It is difficult to fathom the pride Madame Sikorska experiences on this occasion as she sees the results of her devotion to her students. Her student, Marie Sklodowska Curie, has won and been awarded two Nobel Prizes. As an aside, after World War II, the name of the Institute is changed to the Maria Sklodowska Curie Institute of Oncology, and to date, it is the leading cancer research and treatment center in the country. Back to the text. Despite the joy in being able to give lectures in her native language, the fact remains that Poland is still under Russian domination. Marie's nephew, her brother's her brother Joseph's son, is a factory worker. During Marie's visit, he has been in prison for 15 days, and his crime is writing patriotic poetry. Returning to Paris, Marie is absorbed with building details of the laboratory. The site is on the Rue de Pierre Curie and Marie. It is... <laughs> I'm sorry. The site is on the Rue de Pierre Curie, and Marie is seen slogging through the mud at the site, checking on progress. Part of the Curie laboratory is to house the largest collection of natural radioactive elements. This collection from around the globe is also the International Center for Measuring Radium Samples for Medicine and Industry. For years, the Curie Laboratory has been the go-to institution for the certification of radium for industry, medicine, and private requests. Now this will be a state-of-the-art facility. Most important for Marie is the laboratory will provide space for research. July 1914, Marie is touring the new laboratory with de Bjorn. Did they both look at each other and laugh at memories of their work in the shack? De Buren, who has been by the Curies, is he relieved at how far Marie has come in less than three years? Are they wistful that Pierre is not there to see his dream of a laboratory finally come true? The words engraved in stone over the en entrance are Institute of Radium, Pavilion Curie. In the coming weeks, the Institute is ready but empty of scientists. De Buren, Langevin, Marie's nephew, Maurice Curie, and a large number of students are being called up. Marie writes, quote, The few men of the laboratory staff and the students were mobilized, and I was left alone with our mechanic who, would, who could not join the Army because of heart trouble, end quote. World War I, the Great War, has commenced. Germany is invading Luxembourg and Belgium. French casualties in the first month average 10,000 per day. Marie's unclouded vision to assess new circumstances sets the course for the next chapter of her life when other celebrities or wealthy citizens abandon France for more secure countries of England or the United States. Marie remains. We see her stamina, perseverance and resourcefulness fully engaged to alleviate the suffering of millions of wounded for the nation that so recently was making media fodder, fodder of Marie's life. She will be risking her life to help them. In a war that starts on horses and ends with tanks, the new weapons are mangling a soldier's body faster than his brain can catch up. Boys, never having seen a plane, are trying to grasp. What is air support? Sending a radio message is iffy. Use a homing pigeon instead. Media proclamations of war glory are invoked to cover the incoming reports of insidious gore. In the first six weeks of the, ra of the war, the tally of killed or wounded for the Germans is 747,000 and for the French, it's 845,000. Changes are affecting all facets of the war 
equipment, technology, medicine, and weapons. What is hardest to change is people's minds, even when it can save lives. Helmets requested for the French soldiers in 1914 are denied on the grounds that, quote, it would look too German, end quote. French soldiers are not issued helmets until the following year, although they do have red trousers to wear as they start their march off to war. Earlier in the summer of 1914, Marie sent the girls, the cook, and the governess to Brittany for their summer holiday. Marie's train ticket is for August 1st. She never uses it. Irene writes to her mother, quote, Eve works a lot. She doesn't want to do arithmetic, but one shouldn't bother her about that because she puts really a lot of goodwill into doing other things, even German. End quote. Marie, with appreciation for Irene's thoughtfulness, writes back and says, I feel already how much you have become a companion and a friend to me. End quote. Irene will soon be 16 and reads books in English, German, and Polish. Like her grandfather, Vladislav, Irene loves Charles Dickens, Charles Dickens. Having finished her entrance exams, she expects to be starting at the Sorbonne this October. As the war becomes an immediate reality, their letters turn from gentle concerns of daily life to legitimate fears of being separated. Irene is begging her mother to be able to return to Paris. Marie worries that Paris will be invaded and says no. Marie writes her daughters to warn them that if Paris is under siege, their communication might be cut off and they may not hear from her. And she adds, quote, If that should happen, endure it with courage, for our personal desires are nothing in comparison with the great struggle that is now underway. You must feel responsible for your sister and take care of her if we should be separated for a longer time than I expected, end quote. Marie writes again the next day and says, I'm afraid you're going to worry because of my letter yesterday. And others' letters say, I'm burning to kiss you. The days go by without giving me that chance. Or, I have just received your sweet letter and I wanted so much to kiss you that I almost cried. Things are not going very well and we have all been heavy-hearted. We need great courage and I hope that we shall not lack it. We must keep our certainty that after the good days, after the bad days, the good days will come again. It is in this hope that I press you to my heart, my beloved daughter. End quote. With rumblings of the front reaching Paris, grocery shelves are turning bare, wives are stockpiling. Practicality prevails as shoe stores are sold out of walking shoes instead of high heels. Headlines in the newspaper extol, quote, The storm has begun, but our ship is seaworthy. Each man is at his post, and we are standing by. Hoist the flag, end quote. Marie is anxious. If the Germans take Paris, a list of casualties could include her name. Who will care for her daughters? Marie can't count on her siblings in Poland. She has no news of them and won't until the end of the war. Watching over the girls now is a Polish governess and a maid who are not able to quell the girls' fear as they see men in the village receiving notices to report to duty. The girls still want to come back to Paris, but Marie insists they stay put. In typical Marie fashion, she writes them and says, we must try to make ourselves useful, end quote. She instructs them also, if you cannot work for France just now, work for its future. Many people will be gone, alas, after this war, and their places must be taken. Do your mathematics and physics as well as you can. End quote. But the strain is ever there of wanting to be with her daughters, and Marie writes, I am dying to come and hug you. I don't have the time. There are moments when I don't know what to do. I want to hold you close so badly. And the girls write every day to reassure their mother. Irene adds her pleas to return to Paris, stating, quote, we must be together in this time of trial. By November 1st, three months into the war, 310,000 men, that's approximately 3,500 per day, have died. And 300,000, that's about 3,300 men per day are wounded. 
The Ministry of War is determined to keep a positive spin on the gruesome facts. They announced to the press, quote, All wounded agree that the wounds are not painful. The speed with which they are inflicted as well as their heat ensure that there is no danger of infection and the disorders caused by them are for the most part insignificant. End quote. And then I have as an aside, clearly whoever has written this has never been shot. Marie believes the Germans will eventually lose, but she knows the war will not end quickly. And in spite of what the Ministry of War tries to have citizens believe, the wounded are in pain and they are suffering. With new weapons available, the death toll and number of wounded will be greater than previous wars. And Marie understands, and what Marie understands is that not having x-ray equipment at the front line, soldiers are suffering needlessly. Doctors, unable to see where bullets are lodged in the patient, are blindly probing in the bloody flesh. Limbs are cut off and bodies are disfigured. Marie writes in the beginning months, quote, The lack of equipment and the lack of information at the beginning of the war permitted operations without radiological exam, which later would have been considered criminal. The custom was to have x-rays at the main centers, which were at the rear of the front, miles away. End quote. Marie challenges the military health service to have x-rays available at the front. They are not jumping to acknowledge, let alone resolve the problem. X-rays are new and seen as a luxury. The health service's perspective is that x-rays are only for the wounded who are transported back to Paris. Bringing technicians and x-ray equipment to the front line is simply not a consideration. Marie fights to break through this roadblock. Less than two weeks into the war, by August 12th, the Ministry of War appoints Marie to the position of Director of the French Red Cross's Radiological Service. They give her orders to form a fleet of cars supplied with the x-ray equipment and staff necessary to be a mobile unit in the field and at the front. The orders state the wounded are to be given radiological examinations right away. As Marie attacked the mountains of pitchblende to find radium, she must now find equipment and personnel in a time of war. Marie envisions having a fleet of mobile x-ray units staffed with trained technicians to be driven to any active battlefront hospital with wounded soldiers. The first two such vehicles are donated by the Red Cross of France. Clearly, this is not enough for 3,000 men per day being wounded. Marie starts by collecting the unused x-ray equipment from laboratories, from offices of doctors, and from companies that manufacture scientific instruments. Next, Marie needs to acquire the cars, which she does by visiting the well-to-do women and asking them to donate their car. Marie promises them, quote, I'll give it back to you after the war, end quote. Many ladies give their car and they give money. Motivation might be that a German plane has just dropped three bombs on Paris. They are also dropping leaflets claiming, quote, the German army is at the gates of Paris. The only thing for you to do is to give yourselves up, end quote. The next step for Marie is to visit body mechanic shops to see if they will turn the cars into vans. The vans have no front doors and they are painted regulation gray with the Red Cross emblem on its sides. The vans will have a battery to generate enough electrical current to produce x-rays. Additional equipment includes a folding, ta folding table for the patient, photographic plates, a screen, heavy curtains, cotton gloves, and a lead-filled apron to protect from the x-ray tube on the movable stand oh, as protection from the x-ray tube. The fleet of vans will rise to 20. The vans become known as La Petite Curie. And you can look up, if you want to Google it online, you know, you can just type that in and there's a beautiful picture of even Marie sitting in the front of one of them. Back to the text. Marie takes a crash course in anatomy and x-ray techniques. Not satisfied with the training, Marie develops a class herself. Next, Marie needs to train staff in nursing and how to operate the equipment. 
students come to realize they must learn more than medical steps. The new technicians will have their sensibilities challenged with the sounds of groans and the sights of gashing wounds to say nothing of seeing naked men. Many of Marie's students are middle-class women coming from very sheltered lives. One woman wrote, quote, I had never seen a nude woman. I had scarcely looked at myself in the mirror, end quote. The field technicians will have no support for them for their moments of tears and distress. Any problems with equipment they must solve on their own while they handle the tidal wave of incoming wounded. For the Battle of Somme, the British will have 60,000 casualties the first day. 150 women go through Marie's two-month training. They learn the equipment and how to read information. Eve admires her mother's teaching style and writes of Marie that her ability to bring science down to the level for a chambermaid to understand, end quote. The training is a time-consuming effort for Marie to develop the curriculum as well as teach the classes. Later, both Italy and the American Expeditionary Forces will request Marie's help in developing these training classes. When all, when all the logistical obstacles are resolved, there is still the resistance from the frontline surgeons that Marie must overcome. Medical personnel are resentful of having their practice challenged by a civilian, especially a woman. Patients are clinging to life as doctors cling to their stubborn mentality of, we've always done it this way. It is only due to Madame Curie and her authority that she can override their objections. When the doctors finally become accustomed to using the x-ray procedure, they streamline the process even more by taking out the step of having the picture developed. They can perform the operation from the radiological screen. Marie is trained and equipped with the first petite Curie. She is notified by telegram or telephone calls with the details of when and where wounded are arriving. On her way out the door, she picks up her black briefcase with a few toiletries. The only extras she has with her are a few photographs of her parents. Marie has gotten her driver's license so she can drive without a military chauffeur. Day or night, through any weather, she drives 20 miles an hour to the field hospitals of the battlefields. And as an aside, the battlefields where Marie attends the wounded include... The, battle, the Battles of Amiens, Ypres, which is Y-P-R-E-S, and Verdun. Back to the text. Marie is called to some sites that require her to travel by train. Officials at the station tell Marie it can take up to three days to have her equipment loaded and to the front. Marie, and later Irene, they won't accept this answer. And Marie writes, quote, Many a time I loaded my apparatus on the train myself with the help of the employees to make sure that it would go forward instead of remaining behind several days at the station. And on arrival, I also went to extract from them the encumbered station. I guess, which means, of course, she got her own equipment off. <laughs> Early September, the Germans are closing in on Paris. Residents can see the flashes of artillery. The government and citizens are crowding on trains going south as they abandon the city. September 6th, the Battle of Marne has begun and there is fear that Paris will be captured. Officials know Marie's radium is a national asset and that this cannot fall into the hands of the Germans. Marie is instructed to take the radium south to Bordeaux for safety. Marie is one of the passengers on a train leaving Paris. She has a 45-pound lead box at her feet. In the box, she has packed the one gram of radium. Arriving at Bordeaux the next day, Marie rents a safe deposit box and leaves her radium there. She can only hope it will be out of reach of the Germans. She takes the train back to Paris that same day. No civilians on the train are going back to Paris, only soldiers reporting for duty and Marie. One soldier shares his sandwich with her, and he asks her, Are you Madame Curie? Marie gives her usual response, No, 
you must be mistaken. Marie could have stayed safely in Bordeaux, or she could have traveled to be with her daughters. Instead, Marie returns to Paris where the Germans are closing in and the wounded need x-rays. Irene is desperate to be in Paris and she writes her mother about her latest distress. The country people in the village are suspecting the Curie girls of being German spies. Hearing them speak to their maid and governess in Polish, the vill villagers assume they are speaking German. On one occasion, a man bursts into their house and accuses the girls of being spies. Irene informs Marie she is going to discuss the issue with the mayor. Irene is also giving French lessons to the maid and the governess to help them not stand out. Irene writes, It means more because you yourself were accused of being a foreigner and we haven't anyone in the army. They say I'm a German spy. I'm not very frightened about all this, but I am very upset. It makes me sad to think people take me for a foreigner when I'm so profoundly French and I love France more than anything else. I can't help crying every time I think about it. End quote. Marie writes back to Irene and she says, I was sorry to hear that you're having trouble over your nationality. Don't take these things too much to heart, but do your best to explain it to the people you see. Remember also that not only should you endure these little miseries with patience, but that it is actually your duty to protect Josephine and Valentine, and that's the Polish housekeeper and governess, who are foreigners. This would be your duty even if they were German, because even in that case they would have the right to live in Brittany. Darling, try to be more fully aware of exactly what your duty is as a French woman to yourself and to others." End quote. In Paris, there is insufficient transportation to get the troops to the front line. With the Battle of Marne raging, the Paris taxis step up and rush 6,000 troops to the front line. The effort causes the French to win, but the cost is 250,000 troops are killed. The British lose 13,000. The Germans lose 250,000. By September 12th, Irene's birthday, Marie writes and says, quote, The invading forces are withdrawing, and soon you'll be able to return to Paris without too much trouble. End quote. Finally, on the 20th, Marie writes, You have my permission to come back by, your, by yourself. If you can bring luggage, take the leather-covered hamper. There isn't much time for taking care of one's clothes here, so if you can, bring them. Back in Paris, Eve and Irene return to classes. Irene begins training at the Red Cross to be a nurse, and she starts classes at the Sorbonne in mathematics and physics. The French government is appealing for gold and silver to pay for the war. Marie offers her medals, including the Nobel Prize medals. The government declines, so Marie uses most of her Nobel Prize money. And what could have been the inheritance for her daughters Marie uses to buy war bonds, knowing they will be worth next to nothing at the end of the war. When the threat of Germany overrunning Paris is over, Marie goes to Bordeaux to retrieve the gram of radium. Marie has perfected her skills for using x-ray machinery. As a driver, she learns how to repair cars, change a tire, and clean a dirty carburetor. On her way to the front line, when a sentry refuses her passing, Marie finds a different road to get through. Along with driving, Marie will load, unload, pack, and load again all the equipment. Never requiring special treatment, she sleeps in a nurse's room, a hospital room, or a tent. During the whole war, only one kidney attack keeps her in bed for a few days. Otherwise, Marie can be found at the front line or in one of the French or Belgian hospitals as a mere technician performing x-rays or teaching a training program for more nurses and technicians. When working at the field hospitals, Marie is wearing her usual worn black dress with a red cross band on her arm. Society women visiting the hospitals, they don't recognize that this is, that this nondescript and unassuming woman is Madame Curie, the famous twice Nobel laureate. She hears their comments about her and doesn't bother with any indignance. 
Marie is with the Belgian Ambulance Service for several occasions when King Albert and Queen Elizabeth are visiting. She makes no record of their visit. Instead, she records, but nothing was so moving as to be with the wounded and to take care of them. Almost everyone did his best to facilitate the X-ray examination, notwithstanding the pain caused by any displacement. I can never forget the terrible impression of all that destruction of human life and health, men and boys, in a mixture of mud and blood, many of them dying of their injuries, many others recovering but slowly through months of pain and suffering." End quote. Marie remains implacable in the face of caring for ten wounded or hundreds of wounded in one day. The patients range from those with the calm of being near death to those overcome with abject fear of having an x-ray. Marie reassures frightened soldiers and says, you'll see, it's just the same as a photograph. If the time with patients is three hours or twenty, Marie stays till all the wounded have received an x-ray. If the field site demands repeated visits, Marie will make the location a permanent installation to have x-rays. By the end of the war, there will be over 200 x-ray installations. Marie's comments during the war are subdued and uncomplaining, and she writes, Of the hospital life of those years, we keep many remembrances, my daughter and I. Traveling conditions were extraordinarily difficult. We were often not sure of being able to press forward to say nothing of the uncertainty of finding lodging or food. Eve records one of Marie's visits to the front and says, The melancholy procession began. The surgeon shut himself and Madame Curie into the dark room where the apparatus in action was surrounded by a mysterious halo. One after the other, the stretchers laden with suffering bodies were brought in. The wounded man would be extended on the radiological table. Marie regulated the apparatus focused on the torn flesh so as to obtain a clear view. The bones and organs showed their precise outlines, and in the midst of them appeared a thick, dark fragment, the shot or a piece of shell. End quote. And the doctor writes Marie, quote, I am on the go from morning to night. I managed to carry out 588 examinations during the month of July. I don't think I can go on assuming this kind of responsibility much longer. And Marie light, writes later, quote, To hate the very idea of war, it ought to be enough to see just once what I saw so often during all those years, men and boys brought to the ambulance behind the lines filthy and covered with blood, end quote. These memories are shared with her daughter, Irene. At 17, Irene is as calm as her mother, and she has inherited her mother's dry wit. She knows she must not laugh when she watches her mother use charm with the Inspector General of the Military Health Service, who has come to inspect the radiological posts. Marie informs the inspector that these are posts that he had authorized. Another time, Marie and Irene are stopped by sentries who forbid women to enter dangerous territories. Marie and Irene can sometimes talk their way past the sentry. Other times, they must go a different, longer route. Irene records in her journal about a doctor who wouldn't believe her as to the location of the shrapnel. Irene writes, after carrying out the task, not an easy one, of teaching the methods of localizing, localizing projectiles to a Belgian doc, military doctor who was opposed to the most elementary notions of geometry. <laughs> God, that's good sarcasm. So, to anyone with doubts of Irene's abilities, Irene responds, quote, My mother had just as much confidence in me as she had in herself. End quote. By the next year, Irene is on her own to install an x-ray facility at a military hospital in Amiens. She is also responsible for the facility at Ypres. <clears throat> Irene has learned how to repair equipment and train nurses. She lives alongside her mother without complaint like a soldier in battlefields. Marie calls her my companion and friend. 
Guns and cannon fire are the backdrop to her days, and in a few months she will be in charge of her own field radiological facility in Belgium. Up to this time, Irene has been enrolled at the Sorbonne and has graduated with honors in mathematics, physics, and chemistry. Irene, when she turns 18, is at a field hospital, and she writes to her mother, I spent my birthday admirably, except that you weren't there, ma chérie. On the streets of Paris, women are working in jobs that previously were only for men. The tram has conductresses and female ticket takers. Women are watering public gardens, delivering the mail, and becoming car mechanics. Marguerite Burrell is conducting aptitude tests for women and running a recruiting station. She is in charge of sending women off to jobs in gunpowder factories, airplane factories, where, railways, and mail delivery. Mar Sorry, that's my dog. If you've been listening to all these chapters, he, yes, he takes big long naps while I read. Marguerite will later be running a hospital and Henriette, uh, Perrin, that was Marie's backyard neighbor and friend, is a volunteer nurse. The shift for the role, women's role is slower in the hospital wards. The French, unlike the British, do not have the women's auxiliaries of the armed services. In fact, there is a movement to take young women from the French hospital wards. <clears throat> and this is what they write. On the grounds that the sites they saw there are not fit for, quote, well brought up young girls, end quote. If Marie has ever cared about fashion, she should now be pleased that her style is in fashion. Coco Chanel has declared the new style should be comfortable. For workplace clothes, skirts are going up, hair is pulled back in buns or cropped. However, Marie is focused on the recent developments. January 1st, 1915, Marie writes to Paul Langevin, who is an army sergeant, and she says, I have had a letter saying that the radiological car working at St. Paul region has been damaged. This means that the whole North is without any radiological service. I'm taking the necessary steps to hasten my departure. I'm resolved to put all my strength at the service of my adopted country. Since I cannot do anything for my unfortunate native country just now, bathed as it is in blood after a century of suffering. Over a year has gone by and there is still no word from her Polish family. She writes on August 6, quote, Poland is partly occupied by the Germans. What will be left of it after their passage? I know nothing of my family, end quote. The Curie side of Marie's family is suffering, too. Marie's nephew, Maurice Curie, is determined to fight for his country, and he walks from the battlefield of Marne, heading north to the front of near Rems. Marie, or Maurice, will write, quote, 130 kilometers, which is about 81 miles, on foot, sack on back, rain and mud, hardly any food, across the mass graves of Epernay, Montmurel, etc. It is unbearable. End quote. He will spend a year near Verdun, which is the north border of France. Of Verdun, one infantry man remembers, quote, as soon as I saw the battlefield, even though I had already spent 14 months at the front, I thought, if you haven't seen Verdun, you haven't seen anything of the war, end quote. Later, Maurice writes his sentiments, an echo of so many, and he says, this war, which never ends. The war years press on. During 1916, there is a rallying cry, they shall not pass, as the Germans once again are pushing to invade France. The Battle of Verdun begins in February 1916 and won't end until December. The French hold the Germans, but the cost is more than 700,000 troops killed or wounded. French casualties are 337,231, of which 162,308 are dead or missing. Holding the line at Verdun, there is only one road, the Sacred Way, it's called, to get in and to get out. 
It has 12,000 vehicles passing through to keep the lifeline of supplies into Verdun. The stream of traffic averages one vehicle passing every 14 seconds for days and nights. Men who were not deemed strong enough or young enough to fight instead have driving shifts of up to 75 hours at the wheel. One driver remembers, quote, For a week I was driving day and night without lights on unbelievable roads, often with a load twice too heavy for my truck. And yet you couldn't drag along, slow down, because shells were flying all around. One of them, an Austrian 130, sent the residue of its powder right into my face. End quote. Marie corresponds with soldiers throughout the war. Letters from her nephew describe the wretched circumstances. Marie, Maurice writes of his life in the trenches for weeks and months on end. He contends with freezing rains, rats, and lice. All this is aside from the fact they are under constant enemy fire. The situation worsens in April 1915. The Germans start using poisonous gas. André de Buren becomes the director of Chemical Warfare Service to find ways to combat the chlorine gas shells being launched to the trenches of the French and the British troops. Men are filling the hospitals half blind and coughing up their lungs from mustard gas. Marie's friend from England, Hertha Ayrton, invents a fan that clears the poisonous gases from the trenches. Paul Langevin is transferred from digging ditches and making earthworks as an army sergeant to being back in the laboratory as a physicist. Using quartz from Pierre's collection, Paul is fine-tuning the ability to use ultrasound to detect the enemy submarines that are wrecking havoc on the seas. In 1916, 936 Allied ships are sunk. In, 900, in 1917, the number reaches 2,681. This is not only a loss of crew and ships, but a dire loss of cargo, food, and fuel for England. Winston Churchill writes, The hanging by a thread, a very slender thread, and one that is in great danger. End quote. A small reason for joy comes for Marie when Jean Perrin is assigned to her service. In January 1915, they are traveling north together. On this one trip, they have two flat tires, crash into a tree, and stop for a cup of tea. For another tri trip, Marie has a driver, and they are returning to Paris. A sudden turn by the driver throws Marie from the car, because they have no doors, remember, into a ditch. The boxes of equipment are in the ditch, too. The driver frantically looks for Marie among the boxes and is calling out, Madame, Madame, are you dead? Marie never tells the girls of this incident, but they see the blood-stained linens in her dressing room. They also get the details when the story hits the newspapers. Marie's wounds are mild compared to the injuries in battle. From July 1st through November 1st of 1916, the Battle of Somme ensues. One medic wrote, Hunting for the dead, horrible deliveries of wretches, battered to pulp, blood flows, the very sheds are groaning, end quote. Noted as one of the bloodiest military battles in history, 1.5 million casualties are recorded. From 1916, through the end of 1917, there are no bombs dropped on Paris. That reprieve comes to an end in January of 1918, when the Germans throw their entire military strength into the Western Front. Supply lines into the city are cut, putting gas in short supply, and bread is rationed. Parisians are freezing for lack of coal. Worse than people suffering the cold is the scarcity of water due to frozen pipes. All the while, the death toll of soldiers continues to rise. <clears throat> Rutherford is visiting Paris in 1917 to give a lecture. Perrin, Langevin, and de Buren are working in the laboratories on war research. Marie is also in town. They gather to hear Rutherford give his lecture and then Marie has her colleagues over for tea. 
Rutherford remarks about Marie that she is, quote, rather gray, worn and worn out and tired, end quote. Thanks, Ernest, for that astute observation. <laughs> Marie looks tired because she is tired. Aside from 20 years of being exposed to more radiation than any other human being, Marie continues to be exposed due to the x-ray work she is providing. For three years, Marie has given complete dedication to the wounded. She travels in any weather in cars that have no doors and are started by cranking the engine. She sleeps wherever she can find a spot and eats whatever is available at the moment. Add to this, Marie continues to watch over her new laboratory. She moved all the laboratory equipment from the old building to the new building in 1915. She does this with no money or help. Using one of the radiologic cars, she makes trip after trip after trip, loading and unloading, and then setting up the equipment in the new laboratory. Marie wants the new laboratory to be up and ready when the war is done. Add to this, Marie is a mother, watching over her daughters. She must see to their safety, their education, and their well-being. Aside from Marie's trips to the front, she prepares radon tubes to be used in the medical field. Marie calls these tubes emanation bulbs. Marie has no assistance and makes the emanation bulbs herself. And she writes, I proceeded to place at the disposal of the health service, not the radium itself, but the emanation which can be obtained from its regular intervals. End quote. Marie provides this service past the end of the war. The tubes are used to treat the wounded and sick both military and civilian. 1918 will see the end of the war, but not without a fight, literally. On January 30th, 30 planes fly over Paris and drop 144 bombs, equivalent to 7,000 pounds of explosives. This raid is the largest so far of the war. The Germans see this as a means of softening up the target before putting their full force into an attack on the Western Front. By March, the aerial assault increases. The Germans have a siege gun dubbed the Paris Gun. This gun is capable of hurling 200-pound shells from 75 miles away. With no warning sound of a plane engine overhead, the shell comes arcing down from 25 miles up in the sky. Meant to break the morale of civilians, the Paris gun is effective. On the first day of the siege, Parisians who have survived nearly four years of war must withstand 21 of these shells landing in Paris. In the following days, the Parisians withstand an average of 20 shells per day. There is no reprieve for a religious holiday. On Good Friday, a church is hit. The roof collapses, along with a stone vault and a support pillar. 88 people are killed. 68 are wounded. The gun isn't withdrawn until August, just ahead of the advancing Allied forces. The Germans must be held back. From January through May, they are less than 40 miles from Paris. Writer Helen Pearl Adam records, quote, The worst days of 1914 seemed come again. After four years of heroism and endurance, after four years of civilian patience, after four years of tested faith in victory, the solid ground beneath our feet threatened to fail. The people who remained in Paris kept fla their flag flying. End quote. Parisians, quote, held furtive consultations as to what arrangements we could make if we had to walk out of Paris at one gate while the Germans walked in at another, end quote. The Germans are pushed back, but the next assault from is from within the city. That autumn, there is a global flu pandemic sweeping through Paris, France. For 1918, after four years of war, personal suffering and loss of for millions, another 237,509 French citizens die from the flu pandemic. By November of 1918, 
The war statistics are as grim as the photos. Of the 8.4 million mobilized French forces, approximately 1.4 million are killed, 4.3 million are wounded, and 537,000 are prisoners or missing. The casualty count is 6.2 million. So if you are active duty in this war, you have a 73.3% chance of getting killed or wounded. Not good odds, and it would be higher if not for a petite woman who insisted on having x-ray facilities at the front. Records from just 1917 to 1918 show that over 1.1 million wounded soldiers received x-rays. Edith Wharton writes of 1918 on the 11th day of the 11th month at the 11th hour, and she says, Through the deep, expectant hush, we heard, one after another, the bells of Paris calling to each other. Our hearts wavered and doubted. Then, like the bells, they swelled to bursting, and we knew the war was over. End quote. After 1,561 days of war, on November 11, 1918, the guns are quiet. Marie and Irene are working in the laboratory when they hear cannons roar at 11 a.m., the church bells ringing. The two women go to stores to buy French flags, but they are sold out. They hurry to a fabric store to buy blue, white, and red cloth. Marie and Irene make a flag and hang it across the pavilion curie. Marie and thousands of others go to the Champs-Élysées to celebrate. Marie has more reason to celebrate, too. With the end of the war, Poland is a free country. Under the domination of outside rule for over 150 years, Marie writes her brother Joseph, quote, We have seen that resurrection of our country, which had been our dream. We did not hope to live to see this moment ourselves, end quote. Marie has not yet heard from Bronia, and there is a political tangle in alliances for whether Poland will be kept its will be will keep its freedom. When reporters ask Marie about quote, the Polish question, Marie keeps her answer vague. Nicholas II has announced that after his victory in Austria, he will quote, reform Poland under his authority. End quote. Regardless of what Nicholas says, Marie is making plans to go and see her family in Poland. She hasn't seen them in years. The end of the war isn't a return to the good old days. Eve records of her mem mother, quote, the memory of the thousands of hacked up bodies she had seen, of the groans and shrieks she had heard, was to darken her life for a long time, end quote. Families must come to grips with the fact that their sons, husbands, and fathers are not among the men coming home. One in ten able-bodied men have been killed. For the student population, this decimates half of the students of 1911, 12, and 13. Many surviving students are scooped up by industry where their salaries outdo any potential income in research. For the French economy, the salary increase, the salaries increase, but not exceeding the inflation. During the 1920s, there are strikes and civil unrest. The competition for jobs adds to the pressure for women to get back in the house and leave the jobs for men. The freedom that was growing for females is reversed. Women who had gone to work as factory workers, nurses, technicians, teachers, farmhands, and mechanics relinquish their rights. It will take another 27 years and another world war for women to even have the right to vote. For the Curie family, Irene is appointed as assistant in the lab. This ensures an income for her. Marie is offered a state pension again, and this time she accepts. The income is necessary relief because Marie has given much of her money for war bonds, and Marie is close to being broke. And that's the end of chapter 10. Thank you.